Today's episode is brought to you by Magic Mind. And if you ever wanted to really get the most out of your mind, then this will help you do it. This is something that really will just put you right into that flow state instead of just shifting gears all day. Quit living manually. Do it automatic. Magicmind.co It's basically the organic version of 5-Hour Energy. But it's not trash like that stuff is. It's positive stuff. You can check it out, magicmind.co. Use promo code THEO for 10% off. Today's guest is a mixed martial artist. He's a three-time Bellator lightweight world champion. He's a fitness and training entrepreneur as well, I think it's safe to say. And uh, he just signed his contract for the UFC, entering an insane lightweight division. Uh, happy to have him here today, Mr. Michael Chandler. What are you taking right now, Michael? This is just You're my obviously... vi- this is just my vitamins. I freaking completely forgot all the way. Okay, because there's a lot of rumors about you out there. What are you taking right now? I just want to know exactly. It was uh, um, fish oil. It was fish oil, turmeric, beta alanine, magnesium, BCAAs. And do you take that once a day? Um, twice a day. There's the formula in the in at night. There's like one or two other things that help me sleep. I think that's about it. Okay, and how uh, I'll send you my supplement list. Actually, will you? I do. I just did it for my buddy yesterday. Dude, I need a little bit just, of rest. I don't know if I could take your supplement list, man. <laughs> no, it's dude. It's all just it's all just like the little micronutrients that you're probably not getting from your food, and that's it. And then for me, for you, for all of us, like just anti-inflammatory antioxidants. Like that's the most important thing. Did you see a blood specialist, or how did you how did you start to get on this regimen? I did. I did a couple of years ago. Just to just to look at all my stuff, like where I was at, hormone levels, and all that kind of stuff, because um, that's the idea. Like, we, how do you how do you legally keep your body in tip top shape? Good diet and rest are like the two most important thing. But then it's supplementation, making sure you're taking care of your body every after every single workout. Like BCAAs, protein, those are the two things that I would die on a die on a freaking mountain for. Those are the two things that I've been taking over the last ten years that are just that have always kept me feeling good so you take them right post workout obviously protein and then you do the bcaas yeah bc i mean pretty much i have a blender bottle with me th- three times a day like in the morning i get up and i oh creatine so i do creatine for oh, the brain yeah be- the brain I used benefits. To do creatine when i would bust boy actually when i Dude, bust tables well that's the thing like i kind of steered away from it because i thought i thought creatine was just like you know the freaking dudes who just wanted the big biceps and they freaking lift weights in high school. No oh, explode. Yeah. It was no explode and freaking creatine. Oh, dude, that's, that no explode all it was, was crazy <laughs> back in the day. We didn't even read the whole label. We just thought it said Knox on Nobody it. Nobody knew what the heck it was. Dude, like that it was stuff just was like crazy. Just get they busted tingling. some kid at our school with two things of it. <laughs> yeah, and they exactly. called the police on him. Exactly. They're trying to. He was trying to sell it. <laughs> yeah, trying dude. to sell it. Freaking yeah, snorting no explode. It. He's just spooning it out to here, people. Here, put this in your mouth and you're. Yeah. Some dumb kids out there before his test getting two hits. <laughs> of it like, like oh, damn, bro you're just I gonna got be an a. awake idiot <laughs> i'm pretty sure i got an a man i'm pretty sure i got a you get an a I'm pretty sure i got an a now nah, you got a you got a d kevin yeah. <laughs> kevin always got Sorry, a d kevin dude. you got a d minus man <laughs> kevin always got a d <laughs> kevin was that kid who would sit in class and he would have the hoodie and he would close it completely, completely. and then sit there the entire class yeah, exactly. just draw both strings down and just have it completely just be shut. Like, i'm cool miss yeah. davis yeah, yeah. leave me alone man had a rough night um so what else so your regimen is sleep what is it because when i watch you man like you know when i watch your fights it's like jesus christ even as a viewer i'm like will this guy stop for a second so i can like it's too many frames per minute it's like how can i visually catch up to what's going on here dude it's i mean that that to me is just that's god's just god's gifts man like some some because you know what it is it's i'm not afraid to freaking lose and i'm not afraid to, i'm not afraid to not like it get, becomes cliche i'm not i'm really not afraid to die in there and i'm really not afraid to get tired either trust me i've been tired i've passed oh, out i passed I'm not out afraid inside to of get a, tired yeah i pot, i passed out inside of a fight once 
from, really? from just exhaustion. Woke up before the fifth round. Coach carried me to the stool. Woke up on the stool and then fought the fifth round. So once you've been there, you're just like, well, there's really nothing that's going to stop me. you know. And, and I think it's just – it's wrestling. Like in wrestling, it was seven hard minutes in their face, push them out of bounds, take them down, do whatever you got to do like to win the match. Like shoot more times than he does. Go harder than he does. Foot on the gas, all, all gas, no brakes, like, and just go. So I think that wrestling mindset is just like now it doesn't work as well in fighting because it's fifteen minutes, it's twenty five minutes. You got to be a little more. You got to ne- negotiate those spaces a little bit more and not go so hard all the time, or else you will die. You know? Yeah. Do you? Is it a psychological thing for you in that first round? Because I mean, you come out in some first rounds, like, dude, I would even. You know, if they let me wear a ton of padding, I might go against you in like a ninth round. But a first (laughs) round would be somebody wanting to die, it seems like. Yeah. Do you come out there with a different psychology in the first round? Kind of like, is that part of your mindset? Like, I'm put, everything is right here? Yeah. Because I think some people, some people are slow starters. And case in point, like I think Khabib, Khabib finished Justin Gaethje the way that he did because I think Justin Gaethje wasn't ready for Khabib to come out with him come out the way they did come out that hot so you can usually just you can get guys flustered you get get guys nervous get guys scared they immediately become a defensive fighter right away and that's why the only fights i've lost are the ones that people ran away from me you know and i lose a split decision you know like that's literally the only pretty much the way that i've lost you know when you were watching the khabib and gaethje what were you uh what do you think after that first round because i felt like gaethje got a lot of time on his feet against him a lot of it got a lot of guys don't get that it seemed like do not get as much time against khabib on their feet yeah no and i think i think that's that i think that was the most surprising thing is is we thought the striking was going to lean towards gaethje's favor yet khabib i think the manner in which khabib fights is just hectic crazy fast pace it's not that skilled. If you go back and watch the fight, there really wasn't a ton of strikes that were landed. They landed on Justin's hands. They landed on Justin's elbows, forearms. Like it wasn't like he hurt uh, Gaethje numerous times. He just got—I think he just got Gaethje scared. And I and I hate using the word scared because I don't like to talk about the guys in my division. Right. With terms and, and like obviously that, Justin's like, not a guy who gets scared. But I know what you're saying. That yeah. that ner- that energy in the beginning. Or it's even like uh, who was I just talking to? Oh, uh, well, I was talking to, to Brendan about it. I think like it, it's almost like. If you get thrown into a scenario where you're not, you're just not ready, you can make bad decisions, you know. And I think Justin Gaethje also just was making bad decisions on the ground. So I don't think necessarily think Justin Gaethje is that bad on the ground. I think he just got there and he was just like, "What do I do? This guy's nuts." You know, this guy's a freaking mauler. Yeah, he's like a rare snake, kind of. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're Clearly. like, "Why haven't scientists found this dude yet?" You know, <laughs> it's kind of like it's he's almost like, like you would see him more on one of those like David Attenborough kind of like, yeah, you know, the the <laughs> David Attenborough. the Russian anaconda. <laughs> then you would like it seems like he hasn't been scene. discovered. Yeah. It's like, well, somebody test this dude. Yeah, he's like never for reptilianism. Seen. Yeah, or like or like three thousand miles below the sea level. You're like yeah, down it there at the like bottom of the ocean somewhere. He's running on some old <laughs> water for sure. <laughs> When you're watching that fight, did you think um, at all, and I'm a novice fight watcher, you know, I'm new into like just even absorbing a lot of what you guys' world is like. And it's, and the biggest reason is just because it's something that's so scared me my whole life, like any like physical altercation, like never learned how to defend myself, never learned any of that growing up. Nobody even in my ear like, hey, just at least stand there and get hit, you know, none of that. Yeah. So I definitely come from a place of fascination. Did you think when you were watching the uh, Khabib and Gaethje that – that Khabib kind of let the first round happen? Do you feel like he could have finished it earlier? Or do you feel like um, it just that the way it played out was the way it played out? I think the way it played out was the way it played out. Because I think, I mean, I think Khabib just was going and going and just turned it into a, a fight real quick, fast paces. And, and, and I loved it. He just fought with reckless abandon. And this is a guy who's undefeated. Most of the time you see guys who are undefeated protect that record by fighting a little bit more... Uh, you know, a little bit more timid or a little bit more diplomatic, a little bit smarter, you know, if you will. But he just went, he went in there and wanted to get into a fist fight with, with, you know, the, the craziest striker in the division. It kind of goes back a little bit to what you were just saying about uh, the f- not, not being afraid to be exhausted, you know, not being, because I've never thought about it like that. Like I go into any sort of physical, if I'm at the gym or if I'm training or something like, yeah, I'm thinking, okay, in a little bit, I'm going to be exhausted. I'll, that fear is a real yeah. Like a living fear that's in me. Uh, I, I think I think that's one of the greatest fears of of anybody across all walks of life when it comes to athletics. Like nobody likes to get tired. 
you know, people are afraid of getting hurt. People are afraid of, of losing, but man, getting tired is the worst thing in the world. Now also getting tired on the football field means you got caught, you know, means you're, you're running down, you got 80 yards and you're running and you get caught by the, the D back who's just faster than you. Cause you slowed down. That's not that big of a deal, but you get, you get tired and locked into a cage with another man with four ounce gloves. Like that's a scary spot to be in. Cause when, when, when the lactic acid builds up, and the heart rate is through the roof and you can't feel your arms and legs and then you got a man coming at you trying to knock your head off that's a scary place to be and that's a place where nobody wants to be so you know that you know that scenario is all always right there it's only a couple a couple crazy moves away or a, a couple scrambles or a getting hurt and get your heart rate up like it's always there so you just have to it, it's like the, the movie 300 where he always talks about fear is always a constant when he's when he's talking to his his young son at the very beginning of the movie fear is always a constant but accepting it mm. that's where we win the battle accepting the fact that you're, you're always going to that fear is always going to be there and then push him through it that's where the rub is that's where the champions go yeah it's interesting me yeah because i just accepted it in the beginning i was like oh i'm just afraid as fuck when i was young <laughs> yeah. and i just never unaccepted it you know like, yeah. i just never but yeah, that's interesting, man. I was watching that fight last night with you and Eddie Alvarez, man. What a fight. Can you go back and watch that sort of thing? Like, Because I noticed at the end, it's almost like a, you know, you were winning the fight. I think it was four rounds to maybe, you know, I mean, maybe 3-1 or something mm -hmm. in the in the final round. And um, But it's still been such an amazing battle. Like in that last couple of minutes, are you, is do you start to get into a defensive mindset? Like, okay. I have this, I probably have this win in the bag. Like, when do you kind of apply like strategic breaks? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. like you know, uh, de, um, de accelerate, but knowing that you already probably have the win if you can get to the finish line. I never do. And, and, and that's not a smart thing to do. You know, if, if you're a young fighter listening to this right now, like, it's, it's made me a great living, it's got me a lot of fans. Because I just I'm all gas no breaks, but it's also bit me in the behind numerous times, you know. And and even you know as we talk about like I passed out at the end of the fourth round of the, my first Benson Henderson fight, and then lost the fifth round. I won the first four, lost the fifth round. Um, oh yeah, that's because, right, huh? Just because I just kept going, and it wasn't because I lost the fifth round because I took my foot off the, the gas. I just I fought so hard the first four rounds that I didn't have anything left in the tank, and I freaking peed blood afterwards and had rhabdomyolysis and all kinds of crazy stuff. And um, but, what do you do though? So when you're heading into that type of a round, like when you're heading into that type of well, that was you end territory. up in those rounds, man. You end up in those. I mean, yeah, the first fight against Benson that round that. Uh, that fight was insane. I mean, you you know, he took a lot of hits in that in that whole fight. I mean, that, that thing was crazy. Yeah. The suplex, I'm like, what? Yeah. I don't even know. Are we in like Roman times? Like, I don't <laughs> know what was going on, right? It was intense, right? Yeah. But yeah, when you're going into that type of a round, uh, what do you do? Man, so that was when uncharted. When you know that you've run out of a lot of gas, of your, your natural gas. Yeah, that was uncharted territory. You know, I, I, I never would have thought. I would lose consciousness inside the fight. Thank God it happened right at the end, end of, of the, the round. The bell rang, and I'm just sitting there on my knees, and I'm not thinking about anything because yeah, I'm not even got conscious. Kind of stumbled, right? And they're like, yeah. "That's what the announcer said." I'm not even conscious, man. Like I was, and then I sat down on the on the on the the stool. One one coach is in front of me, and then this coach behind me yells something, and that's when I like did this, and then I asked my coach in front of me, "Did I get? Did I just get knocked out? Did I get choked out?" He's like. No man, yeah. this is my my Dutch kickboxing coach Henry Hoof. He's no man. What are you talking about, man? We're going to the fifth round, man. You're doing good. You're to win this fight. Yeah, you're in and spelling I, class, Kevin. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah, what are you I'm doing, like, yeah, man? for sure. And I and I remember I couldn't I couldn't lift my arm because I don't think the blood quite got to my. Because remember I was you said I was stumbling because my feet weren't working and my arms weren't working, so I, I couldn't lift my hands up to protect myself for that fifth round. But that's just uncharted territory. But it's also that that primal animal instinct that you just have inside you where it's like at that point you're a you're a possum backed up into a corner and no matter what you just got to fight you either just curl your table curl your tail curl your tail between your legs and die but how you how do you, you how do you adjust your strategy at that point well at that point the strategy was the strategy was somewhat survive you know and 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 that's why I, that's why i would say if i had more in the tank i would have just went forward with, re with reckless abandon. But at some point you're like, okay, well I need to take a little bit of step back, try to breathe a little bit, you know, because I got into the point of no return. There's a difference between being afraid to get to the point of no return. So all the way leading up to it, you, you're only fighting at 50%, 60%, 70%. But if you fight at a hundred percent, get to the point of no return. After that, you're 100% 
is like 40%, 50%, and you're fighting at 50%, not being 100%, uh, you know, offensive or, 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 or kind of trying to come forward, but essentially you're just, you're in survival mode. And then once you get your, your wits back about you or a little bit of gas, a little bit of blood back to your brain, then you can start throwing offense again, which is, that's kind of what I did in that round, even though I essentially just got into a grappling match with them and, you know, lost the fifth round pretty bad, got a big old cut, you know, but uh, let's go to, we got a question right here. Riley, can you hear everybody okay? Yeah. You can? Everything's good. Okay, great. Hello, hello. Uh, Chase Malden out of Virginia. Uh, for Mr. Chandler, if you saw that Anderson Silva fight this weekend, what are your thoughts on it? And do you think he should retire? Because I think most of us do. And what do you think about just, you know, guys kind of out of their prime trying to fight anyway? Good question. Good question. A lot, dude, uh, a lot of good questions came in for you, yeah. man. Um, you know, Anderson Silva is, you know, one of the greatest of all time. But when you watch his last couple of fights, it's hard to remember the Anderson Silva, the greatest of all time. I think that's why I think what GSP did so well is he was like, I'm done. You know, I'm, I did my thing, crushed it. I made my money. I got a, I left a good taste in people's mouths of A, who I am as a man, as a competitor, what I accomplished, and then I'm going to be be out. The Barry Sanders, if you will, mm. you know. Um, it's always good to retire before people think you should because the fans always want more out of you. You know, selfishly, the fans, all of his fans in Brazil, they they want more out of Anderson Silva. Keep going, keep going, keep going. But before you know it, you know, you lose, you know, in devastating fashion again, or you lose that bad again, and then people can kind of forget. So I would like to see him hang it up, even though, you know, it sounds like he's going to. But I, I – I, I would have said this two three fights ago as well, man. Wow. You, he's he's a he's a icon in Brazil. You know, he's a worldwide you know superstar when it comes to mixed martial arts. He's I never want to talk about the, someone's money or what is enough money or what is enough legacy or whatever. But I feel like he should have enough legacy, should have enough money, should have enough happiness, should have enough of what he's built to be able to sail off into the sunset. So then, what do you think it is that brings someone back at that moment? Like, what is it? Like, if you had to get inside of of his mindset, knowing what it's like to be a fighter. Yeah. Well, and I think that's the difference. And I and I don't want to bring other people up, but I think there's definitely been guys that you that you're like, okay, that guy's only fighting because he blew a bunch of money. He needs some money. Right. He needs to come. He needs to make a paycheck. Oh, if I was in Brazil, dude, with the drugs and women, I'd have blown it all. Dude. You <laughs> yeah. know what I'm saying? Well, I'd yeah. hop back into the ring on one foot, dude. Man. Well, that well, and that's that's the thing. But I don't think I I, I would, right. You're not saying that about him. No, I think Anderson Silva is the guy who just. I bet he's. I bet he's set for life. I could be wrong. You know, like I said, I don't know the guy personally, but there's a lot of guys where you say that guy right there. I know why he's stepping in the cage tonight. He needs another paycheck. He needs to, you know, like Nick Diaz. You mean? Well, yeah. I, I just made that up. Also, <laughs> you no. Know, I mean, I. I don't know. I wonder. I don't know how those Diaz brothers are doing. I bet they're doing all right. But I mean, I know Nate. Nate Diaz did all right when that that Connor fight made a couple million. But you know, it's. Uh, it's it's tough because I'm gonna get to that point eventually, you know, where people are like, dang, it's time to hang it up, you know. But I'm in my mind, in my camp with my coaches, it's, it's something you always have to go back to, your family and your coaches, because you're never gonna want to quit, you know. You're never gonna want to stop unless right. You, yeah, that's what I'm getting at. You're never gonna want to quit. No, even though like a guy like GSP, I mean, there's there's him on the re on record saying he hated fighting. Like he he hated he would show up to the arena and pray to God that the that a comet would come down and hit the arena and they would just end his misery. <laughs> that freaking, that someone would pull the fire alarm, that, that a, there would be a bomb threat, that there would be something where he would just be like, thank God I could go home and don't have to do this. You know, he, he, he talked about in, in, and documented kind of like the anxiety that the guy went through. And this is one of the greatest of all time, a guy who looked unbeatable at times, you know? Still does. Still, yeah. I mean, still, he. I think he could come into the cage right now and at 155, 170 and, and win the freaking title. 185 possibly, you know? So you never know what's motivating a guy, but you got to go back to your coaches, you know, your your closest of kin, your mentors, your family, and and then the people around you that, that know – no matter how much how much more that you accomplish, how much more money you make, they don't benefit from it. They just want to see you happy. You know, mm -hmm. those are the people. That's those that's those are the people you got to listen to. You know, yeah, it's interesting because even in every in every form of entertainment or survival, uh, anything, I guess maybe. I mean, I can relate it a little bit in my own life, but yeah, you, there's these voices that push you to succeed, and like even these invisible voices of people that naysayers, you know, haters that say you can't, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but then at a certain point, 
those voices aren't really helping you anymore. It's more the voices that actually can see you as a human yeah. and saying like, okay, you know, we care about you. We're, there's no, you've proven yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. what do you do now? How do you manage that? Because there's a, there's a, there's a lot of mismanagement, mismanagement at that point as well. And sometimes you're so blind, you just come up so blindly, like just throwing fists, especially in you guys' career, you know? And I see what Poirier in a lot of his fights, in his old fights, you can see, he doesn't even have a look in his eyes. Mm -hmm. He's just like a, a, you know, an animal. You have that animal instinct. But then you get to a point where you're standing on top of the cage and you're like, okay, I'm not, I'm not in this. I'm not fighting for nothing anymore. Like yeah. I'm at a point where I can make some choices for myself. Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of it comes with maturity and stuff too. And 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 I told you it was, it was cool. Like right around the time that we met, you know, I was go, getting ready to go fight, and that was the first time I ever met Poirier because Poirier was cornering a guy who was on the same card, and I just went straight. Where in Connecticut? It was in Connecticut. Oh, Sh Sh Saba Sa Hamasi or Saba Hamas. Saba. Something. Yeah, he just he got a couple wins in a row. Yeah, that guy. you know he's he's good. And Poirier was there the whole fight week, corner him and whatnot. And I just went straight up to him because I I knew at this point I was probably gonna go. I was probably going to leave Bellator, uh, and I was probably gonna hopefully sign with the UFC. My goal was I wanted to sign with the UFC, so I knew I was about to walk up to a guy that I was probably gonna I was gonna be in the same division for sure. I'm probably gonna end up fighting him. But to me, the respect level for a guy like Poirier or even anybody in the division, I don't. I respect you if you step inside the cage and you make your living doing what I do, doing what we do, because this is what was. It, I understand the perils, the trials, the tribulations of this this tough sport that we call our our profession. But went up to him and we were talking a little bit, and I just you know I congratulated on on his last win. He had just beaten Dan Hooker a couple weeks prior. Congratulated him on the fight of the year candidate that, that it was. It was a phenomenal fight. His heart, his determination, what he does outside the cage, the man that he is, the competitor that he is, the father that he is, and then also we kind of talked like about the journey a little bit where it's like, man, 30 something years old now, got a wife, got a kid, got it, you know, doing what we're doing is much different than back in the day. I kind of brought up about how he was some young shaved head punk kid on that documentary. You saw the, do his, oh, do yeah. his documentary yeah. along, and that was Dustin Poirier from back in the day. And he was yeah, in this was documentary. Like this crazy. This is an insane thing coming yeah. out of the swamp. Exactly. And, and it, but it's so cool to see where people start and then where people oh, yeah. end up and then and watch every, and watch people's maturation throughout the journey and and he he would probably if he was sitting here today he would probably say man you know his his career i think is a blueprint for a guy who who started at a certain point has ended up where he's at he's at the top of the game top of the division top of the toughest division in the in the entire world about to fight the biggest global superstar of of mixed martial arts and conor mcgregor he's in a phenomenal spot but you don't just fall there by accident you don't fall to the top of the mountain by just Good by point. coincidence, you know, he had to build and climb and plod and and tread towards that. And a lot of it comes with good things happen to good people, you know. And it's not that they'll, it's not that people don't do the right things; it's that people don't do the right things for long enough. And he mm. has put his time in, grown into a phenomenal man, father, husband, and yeah, and he's, he's going to be a, rewarded. He's a good role model. It. So it's cool just just seeing the maturation process of 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 us as fighters, you know. Yeah. A decade later. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. And it's also, it's interesting to see because, you know, growing up, like a lot of kids in my neighborhood would fight a lot of like, you know, it was a lot of like, you know, a lot of poor kids kind of fight. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just something to do. You don't have cable. You fucking throw two fucking, you know, 48 pounders in the ditch and let them go at it. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> yeah. just different. Dude, I used to invite kid friends over, like kind of rich friends. And then we would go on a bike ride in the neighborhood and I knew some kids were going to fucking fight them. Oh my God. Just because they and you, rich. And you weren't going to be in the fight, Oh, right? bro, I was Don King out there, dog. <laughs> yes, I was but... standing on the side of this. My buddy's like, I thought we were just going to rent movies. I'm like, well, dude, you got to deal with fucking little Thomas Hoover first, son. You know? <laughs> This dude weighs dude. 47 pounds, bro. He's scrappy. Dude, yeah, that's, dude. dude, that's funny. That's a true story. That's a true story, bro. <laughs> one of my friends still gets mad at me about it, man. But yeah, I used to invite he, what, some One of the rich friends? Yeah. One of the rich friends? You guys are still friends? I'm like, you'll be fine, dude. He's got a really nice freaking Haro with, oh. with pegs on it and stuff. And you, you get, the kid the kid comes out with a freaking busted up mongoose like, hey, what's up? Oh, definitely, hey, dude. Hey, what's up, Tommy so, Hoover? <laughs> yeah, Tommy Hoover comes out. Dude, he's got that natural shake in him, bro. <laughs> you know, yeah, just Joe the shit. Lord scoliosis, yeah, bro. Dude. You're just missing a couple <laughs> elements, you know. But yeah, I used to do that shit. But so it's interesting to get to a point. It seems it seems interesting from an outsider's perspective to get to a point where, yeah, you to come from a place of fighting for your 
peace of mind or for your comfort or to feel okay. You mm -hmm. know, like I do stand up comedy to feel okay. I get on a stage. I need something from people. You know, fighters, they, they there's some we're all trying to prove something to ourselves or to others. But to come from a place of fighting, because that's such a physical and brute thing yep. to then get to a place of having some sort of peace in your life where um, where whatever those voices are that probably made you so angry in the first place. That's a wild ride you guys are on. Yeah, and, and it's and it's funny too as the sport has evolved, and even even in the very beginning of of the sport. You know, the sport started with uh, you know Dana White and these guys. They didn't even start the UFC. It was it was started by a different group, and then the UFC and the Fertitas. Dana White bought it and turned it into what it is today. But it, I'm sure there was guys who who fought just for there was no money in it either. So it wasn't like they were trying to make a bunch of money. It was really who was the toughest, who's the baddest dude on the planet from what uh vocation from what background you got you got your boxer there was a boxer wearing one boxing glove where he could throw a jab but he could also grapple you had your karate guys your sumo wrestling guys your street fighters your whatever back flippers some guys get yeah. in there just do a backflip and then get their ass kicked yeah exactly you know, you know? see so they that's how it kind of started and then and then and then it evolved into the sport of okay we can make a living out of this or or it's just a really cool hobby so you saw guys who kind of came from a place of anger but then you see a guy like myself I just like hand to hand combat and I and I don't I don't really like confrontation. The funny thing is I'm very similar to you. Like if, if someone walked in right now and wanted to fight, I'd get this weird nervous tension and I'm like, I'm not trying to fight, man. I'm not here to fight. But you put me inside the cage with you and you and you put a check on the line and, and it's a competition and I can prove myself in a in a in a contest mm. of hand to hand combat. That's when the real competitor comes out of me because I love the contest, but I don't like the conflict, you know? Um so somewhere in between there is is where you. So where, some of your drive comes from a, the competition aspect of it. No, all of it does. I think. I mean, at this point, I realize that all of my all of my admirers, fans, or people who who follow me on my platforms or wanna want wanna say, man, that guy's a guy that I want my kid to be like. They don't do it because I can kick people's ass. Like they don't right. care about that. They do it because they say, man, that guy is a is a symbol and a, a manifestation of a little guy from a little town who was taught to do little things, who had a bunch of ups, a couple downs, never quit, pulled himself up by his bootstraps, dusted himself off every time he got knocked down and became a champion because of it. Now is in, is in the best position of his career because of, of his stick to and his continued to, and drive to move forward. And yeah, it's really cool that he, you know, it's a bonus that he likes to bite down on his mouthpiece and get into a brawl inside of a, uh, a cage, inside of an octagon. But really, we like him for the symbol of what he is, the right. metaphor for what his his career stands for. And I think that's what that's what I like because to me, fighting is so much deeper than just the 15 minutes inside the cage, the 25 minutes inside the cage. It's how you live your life, the honor, the respect, the integrity, and the 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 character that you can build. Because someday I'm going to be retired. I'm going to look back and say, man, that was a really fun ride. It was painful at times, but man, I impacted a lot of people throughout it. And we had a really good time and made some, made some, some coin to be able yeah. to take care of my family. Yeah, it's funny, and I, I hate to keep bringing up Dustin, but we're Dustin Poirier fans here, and, uh, and I'm a Dustin Poirier fan. Yeah, I'm gonna fight him someday. You know, it's gonna <laughs> yeah, happen. Uh, oh, it'll we're, be but, a great fight. But that's the thing. Like, it'll be a great fight. We don't have to hate each other, right? So it's yeah, hundred percent. It's and it seems like there's a lot of respect, especially in that division, man. There's, I mean, there's some uh, God, that's insane. It's just, just bumper to bumper traffic in that division, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, I remember like about a year ago, there was just kind of this thing where you got to start to see who Dustin was as a person through his fighting. Yep. And it was even after the Khabib loss, but uh, I mean, he was bummed. I remember talk, we talked a little bit and I uh, said, but man, you don't understand, like people are seeing you, you're becoming like a hero to people. Like you're becoming win or lose, and it doesn't matter anymore. Yep. Not that that, this is just my mindset. I mean, obviously he wants to win every time, but I'm like, you're becoming... People can see who you are through your art. And that's one thing that that's what's really amazing. I think about having the ability to be in some sort of performance, whether it's fighting, stand up, anything, if you can or anything. I mean, if you're just even if you're just somebody just going, you know, picking up garbage, if you can if people could see your heart through through whatever you're doing, man, that's pretty powerful. Dude, that's that's what it is, because and that's and that's why we have to be careful as a as a human race, as a society to be separated from one another, six foot distance, wearing masks. Oh, it's, like, yeah. I, like I don't want to turn it into a, the political thing or the, or the, you know, the, the pandemic thing or any of that kind of stuff. But it's like, 
I believe God created us for relationships and not just personal one-on-one relationships, but even the, the relationship that Dustin Poirier's fans have with him by watching him <clears throat> via social media, by watching him in his fights. And truth be told, people would care less about him if he was undefeated. People would care less about him if he was perfect. People yeah. love the fact that he gets beaten up battered bruised <laughs> yeah. and then and then pull, pull, picks himself picks back himself up, up every gets time, back yeah. on the mic and says you know what i'm not perfect i'm not i'm not undefeated i have blemishes on my record look at me you know when, when you mess up raise your hand and say hey this is me this is this is my baggage this is my loss but this is my loss to deal with and you can and you will say things about me and you will criticize and you will nitpick but trust me this is I may have lost the the battle tonight, but the war will be won down the line. And that's yeah. and that's what is the beauty of mixed martial arts. Like I have five losses on my record, but people don't care about my losses whenever I win my next fight, or even if I lose my next fight, they don't care. They just the best fighters in the in the entire on the entire planet right now are the ones with multiple losses. The biggest superstars. Your George, George Masvidal has like 10, 11 losses. You know, like Diaz has Diaz has nothing more losses. losses than wins. Maybe Connor's got almost five losses now. You know. Khabib, phenomenal what he has done. John Jones, phenomenal what they have done. But it's also the ups and the downs, the ebbs and the flows, the losses and the wins that that really draw people to these fighters. Yeah, and the different types of fighters. Yeah, it's like some people are like, yeah, they just want the undefeated. But uh, I think more people can relate to a guy that has uh, like a – you know, has the ups and downs. It's like, even like Anthony Smith is one of my favorites, you know. And it's not – I could care less if he wins or loses. It's like – Every time he comes out of that tunnel, yep. it makes me feel like, damn, bro, whatever's going on in my life, I can, I'll, it's going to be fine. You know, mm-hmm. this guy can do, if this guy can come back, um, you know, I can keep, it just reminds me that I can keep going. You Dude, know? And, and that's so cool. Like even, even you just saying that, like I, even it gives me a different perspective <clears throat> knowing you and then, and, and him, like I, I don't, I don't know him, and and I, I don't watch a ton of his fights either. Like, it's, but it's just funny how certain people gravitate towards or are drawn to certain fighters, and I think that's what's so beautiful about mixed martial arts. And obviously, I'm biased because I'm I'm in it, but it's it's so much easier to look at a guy like Anthony Smith or even any any of us fighters compared to, like, say, a baseball player who, you know, he chances are the only thing the only thing you see inside of his performance is okay can he catch the ball can he run the bases can he hit the ball we we get the luxury of being inside of a cage fighting and there's second to second to second in each second that happens inside each of those five minute rounds is up very very high very very low somewhere in the middle craziness going on uncertainty and it's it's just a beautiful sport. It's a really really beautiful sport. And man, it's just really cool to be a part of it. I, I would argue like wrestling is the same same way. Amateur wrestling, college wrestling, I love it because it's it built me into the man that I am. But but mixed martial arts on a global platform is just it's such a beautiful sport because even the guy like you who, you know, Anthony Smith, you're watching him and and it's just like like we said, he's he's in there painting a masterpiece of the physical manifestation of. The ups, the downs, the the your your greatest opportunities and your darkest hour that you personally feel when you watch him fight. And maybe he knows you, maybe he doesn't. Like obviously you're a celebrity, but like the average person, the average person who's like Anthony Anthony Smith is my favorite fighter, who who Anthony may never ever meet, but he made that person sitting on his couch in Poughkeepsie, Mississippi, watching the UFC pay per view yeah. feel something. Yeah, and it's really freaking cool, man. It's pretty crazy. It's, it's powerful. And you guys, have, I mean, you guys' sport is unlike any other because there's so many moments where it's like, okay, how does this, how does he approach the beginning of the fight? Uh, what is this, what has his behavior been like going up to the fight? Um, how does he, uh, how is he managing himself in this beginning, like in this kind of capoeira kind of beginning dance, feeling yeah. each other out? Uh, win or lose, how do they then behave? You know, it's like there's so many moments for people to show every side of humanity it's yep. it's almost yeah i think that's why i think there's so many new fans coming to it too it's like wow it's not just about the fighting there's there's just so much more to it um well, yeah it's like kind of what you said too like it's almost it's almost like of course the fight is the most entertaining part but man think about the walkout think about the you know the the shaking the hands and the, and the hugging of your 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 teammates and your coaches before you go into battle it's literally like Roman times where they were back in the back and they were shaking their hands, you know, like you see gladiator with the the strength and honor thing before they went out there. And like, 
it's don't not to sound cheesy, but that's a lot different than so many other sports. This is so much more raw and real. And it's, and, and, and Ronda Rousey said it back in the day on this, this documentary, it's on Netflix called the hurt business that I was in. It was a pretty really cool documentary about fighting. And she said, you, whether you love it or you hate it, you're drawn to it. People are drawn to it because even if we're the most peaceful person in the world, we are somewhat at some level drawn to, to conflict Yeah. or we're drawn to sport. We're drawn to competition. We're drawn to the contest and, and mixed martial arts is all of that rolled into one. And like you said, there's so many different aspects of the fight that are, that are outside of just the fight, the buildup. And then afterwards, whether or not me and you hated, say, you know, we sold it on TV that we hated each other, or it was real that we hated each other. Are we going to shake hands afterwards? Are we going to, are we going to hug afterwards? Are we yeah, going to shed tears afterwards? Like what's going to happen? You knock me out. Do I swallow my pride and say hi to, you know, say congratulations or vice versa? Or there's any 1 million different scenarios that could manifest themselves and happen inside the cage. And it's, it's the most unpredictable uh, sport in the world, like being tied onto a tornado every single time. And that's why people love it. And that's why that's I love crazy. it. Look, you want to know about money, then you got to know about this, that Americans are overpaying on car insurance by $21 billion. $21 billion. That's a lot. But searching for a better deal to find out how much you are actually overpaying, it can be real trying. But not anymore. Thanks to thezebra.com. TheZebra.com is the nation's leading car insurance comparison site. So, you, you know, it's there's all these other spots you go to. Next thing you know, they're calling you. They're harassing you. They're sending somebody by your house. You're screaming about car insurance, screaming about head-on collisions and stuff and honking on your horn and knocking on your sister's window at night. That's over. The Zebra doesn't do that. The Zebra is the only place you can compare quotes side by side from over 100 providers and choose the best for you in 90 seconds or less. Plus, they will never sell your information to the spammers, ever. You just answer a few questions on a simple, fast form, and they find the best rates and coverage in your state. TechCrunch magazine calls it Kayak for Auto Insurance. How much can you save on car insurance? Go today and start saving at thezebra.com slash T-H-E-O. That's thezebra.com slash Theo, spelled T-H-E-Z-E-B-R-A, thezebra.com slash Theo. You know, recently I was struggling uh, getting a refi Nance um, because I'm trying to get a home and I realized that I had a bad loan and I couldn't refinance because I made some poor payments on a previous loan. I made them 30 days late. I made them 60 days late. I dinged up my credit. But thankfully, that's being solved by Bridge Credit Solutions. They're different. I'll be honest with you. They backed with a 100% money back guarantee for any items that cannot be removed. You will not find that anywhere in credit repair industry. You reach out to Bridge. You tell them what you need done. They take it on. That's how it goes. So it's going to help put me in a position where I can get the refinance that I want. You know exactly what you're paying for at the beginning of your credit repair. No open-ended monthly fees. It's written in the contract, what work is to be done, and how much you're paying. Bridge Credit Solutions. You will need to have bridge report access prior to scheduling your audit. They cannot go over your credit report without it. Thankfully, it costs just $1. This can all be found on the website by simply clicking on the services drop-down bar where you will see bridge report access. Get it done. It's helping me. It can help you. Get those dings off your credit. Get the refinance. Get the low rate you deserve. Visit bridgecreditsolutions.com slash T-H-E-O. They're very personable. They take communication seriously. You can always feel free to call or text no matter the hour, day or night. That's right. Visit bridgecreditsolutions.com slash T-H-E-O. They are helping me. They really are. And they can help you. Let's go to a question right here. We got a question from a beautiful young man right here who's been smoking. <laughs> question for Michael frickin' Chandler. Hey. hey, man. First off, congrats on the UFC contract. Congrats on making it to Fight Island. Getting to hang out there, making the cut like a professional, like you always have been. I got to know, though. 
I, I can tell you're a guy that likes to stay in shape. You're very disciplined. But what's your cheat? Like, say you go out Friday night or whatever. What's your cheat meal or, like, just cheat activity? What do you like to do whenever you give yourself a day off to just unwind? I got to know. Gang, gang. Good luck, buddy. Gang, bro. Yeah, you ever pull Love off the it. side of the interstate and have fucking five or six Doritos? Dude? What are you, what are you, <laughs> I, have some, I can see I, you having five like or six Doritos. two Cool Ranch Doritos, individual <laughs> triangles in your freaking glove Just box. two. Only two. Yeah, yeah. No, man. Like, you know, the most, and I love this question because I think I am one of the guys that people look at and, and they're just like, man, that dude lives it. And I do. But you also have to realize that you're a human being and not a robot. You know, I'm not a cyborg sent back in time to freaking, you know, fight in a cage. Like, okay. That I'm a, yeah, right then. Yeah. Take that question, take out, that question out. No, but, uh, you know, just a normal person. So like right now, you know, you're catching me in between, like I just got done making weight. What was it? F pretty much like 14 days ago. Yeah. It was exactly 14 days ago. So the, for the last two weeks I've gotten, I've gotten workouts in five, six workouts. So like a workout on average every other day just to give myself a some time to heal and b some time to almost feel lazy almost feel like a schlub like you know like you eat a little bit of crap you drink some alcoholic beverages be you know, like i love taking my wife out eating some good food having some drinks open up a bottle of wine but i don't feel great afterwards and it reminds me why i go into a 12 week training camp where there's no alcohol there's no bad food i'm eating out of tupperware containers or or my mega fit meals which is a, a food prep company that i that i use and it's all just chicken lean ground beef salmon turkey lamb mm -hmm. what about a lamb maybe no, not not in there. But I, I do I do like lamb. Lamb's not bad. Lamb's my wife good. makes some good lamb. And then I just couple that with like three or four vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, sweet potato. And that's literally all I eat for twelve weeks straight. So you could shit in a garden and help it out pretty, at that point. Yeah, pretty you know, much. You know, like clean. a human human compost. And so so to answer his question, I love pizza. Um I, I like a thin crust pizza because, man, too much bread gets me. I'm not a Chicago deep dish type yeah. of guy. I'm actually like a St. Louis style thin crust pizza guy. True food here in town. Have you eaten true food? Yeah, I've been over there. True food pizza. A lot of divorcees in there, too, <laughs> yeah. looking for that next man. Yeah, exactly. You know, you, you go, go in there. there. You, Somebody you. ordered me. I was like, I'm not even on this. <laughs> yeah, hey, I'm right there. Good looking one with the mullet. I'll take him <laughs> <laughs> with a side of Chardonnay. Uh, and so true food pizza is actually like one of my favorite pizzas. But, um, and then, man, uh, yeah, so that's so what you I cheat do. some. So I also do. getting yourself probably to feel a little bit like it gives you a place to come back from and also rewarding your body probably from what you went through. I mean, that's very yeah. kind of Native American of you in a lot of ways is just for sure. rewarding your body, knowing that it's doing things for you. It does. And, and, and of course, we got to be careful because the food system that we live in, the agricultural system that we live in is not very – it's not as good as our grandparents – our green peppers now are not as good as our grandparents green right. peppers unless you, get them, unless you get them from the right spot you know and and trying to eat good whole organic foods and whatnot so of course you're doing a little bit of damage by eating the crap but you're also a kind of kind of rewarding your body rewarding your mind that okay let me take take the let me take my foot off the gas a little bit let me be a normal person for a second let me let me harvest a little body fat and let my body thicken back up into yeah. a, into a kind of a normal a normal body and then obviously i'll shrink it back down once fight comes but i, I was in training camp essentially from march all the way through october Jesus. with my last two fights and and well like the fight october 24th i didn't actually fight but i appreciate our man there saying making 155 like a professional that's why i did it you know i wanted i wanted dana white and the ufc fan base right away to see who michael chandler is i'm going to show up i'm going to be there on time, on weight. I've never pulled out of a fight, never said no to a fight. I've never missed weight. Show up on the dot. Who were you most excited? So say you're there. I mean, you were there. And overall, was it a good experience? Was it pretty crazy going over there? Had you ever been to the Middle East? I had not been to the Middle East, but to me, it was just more my first fight week with the UFC. And it couldn't have been better, man. It was so awesome. Obviously, I think a Fight Island fight week is a little bit different than other fight weeks. So they rolled out the red carpet for us. They, you know... I was just getting to rub elbows with my new colleagues, my new my new coworkers, the from Dana White all the way down to the person who like checks you in at the very beginning who's kind of new to the UFC. All of them are the new heartbeats that are in my life. They're it's part of my company who I'm going to, you know, kind of sail off into the, the rest of my career with uh working with. So I wanted to make it a good impression on them, show them who I am, show them Did you, you wear know, cologne or not? Be honest. Cologne? No. Yeah. Axe. Really? No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, crazy, do people wear axe anymore? I mean, Sorry, it'd be I don't so know. great if you did. It'd be awesome. <laughs> hey, you're gonna. You're, I'm just wondering. I gotta go check in. <laughs> yeah, totally. 
<laughs> I'm no, sure there's somebody that's doing that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I just wonder if you would put on cologne or something. Yeah, because you're showing up. You're kind of the new kind of kid in the candy store. You're also kind of the new candy in the candy yeah, store. I am. And, and it's great, too, because I'm not just... I'm not the young kid who got a really sweet spinning back kick knockout from Dana White Contender Series who's 19 years old. Right. I mean, and you can say Sugar Sean O'Malley if you want to. The, oh, yeah. Okay. Actually, actually, that is exactly okay. who he is. No, I'm but joking. he came in. Sean's no, but, great. But yeah. No, but and you, I like but, him. No, Sean's amazing. And and But you don't have that young. You don't. It's not like you have youth, this youthful hype. You have yeah. this long trajectory. Yeah. And anybody who – the good thing is, and I talked – about this the other day, you you can't outrun your reputation. And your reputation takes years to build and seconds to break down and, and just fall by the wayside, you know? And I, I think I think I have a good reputation in the industry. You know, when it comes to and it was and it was great. It, it got me in trouble with a lot of the journalists throughout my free agency process because they're like, you know, the biggest names in, in mixed martial arts like journalism are like, hey man, give me some inside information. Hey man, let me break the story. But I'm like, listen, back off. This is going to, I'm, I'm going to let the UFC do their thing. Whenever, whenever it comes out, it's going to come out. I don't, I didn't get into the position that I'm in without being a phenomenal employee, be a good employee. Mm. And that's what these young kids miss. They got to remember, man, you're still an employee. These guys still sign your paycheck. Don't bite the hand that feeds you. And that was me protecting myself, protecting Bellator from before I left Bellator. That was me protecting the UFC. That was me protecting the other organizations that I was negotiating with, even though I knew I was most, I was going to head in the UFC direction if that door opened itself. But, you know, I had a good reputation coming into this fight week and I think I exceeded ex people's expectations. I hopefully were like, hope I had a lot of a lot of the UFC reach out to me and say, "Hey, man, this is great to work with you. You're easy to work with. You're eager." I also just got done talking yesterday to the one of the UFC PR people, and it's like, I appreciate you saying that, but you have no idea how underutilized I feel like I've been over the last ten years. You know, mm. no offense to Bellator, but they didn't use me enough. They didn't build me enough. They didn't give me the outside the outside uh, opportunities to be on the big stages. I. I was utilized at about 20%, I believe. 20% was me stepping into the cage, putting on great performances for them, which that's you know one of the most important parts. But when it comes to being an athlete, man, microphones, cameras, voice, word of mouth, that's how you build a great platform. That's do you, you feel like it. it's a, a, do you feel like it was any like like it was a shun towards you at all or do you just feel like it's just their company the way it is the size of the company you know like you can only get so big at kmart you know before yeah. you walk into walmart you're like damn you know yeah. they got everything 100 percent. no I, I think it was it's their business model they are they are the legitimate number two organization in the world and their business model was hey we're gonna run a skeleton crew we're gonna put on the best fights we can and we're gonna we're gonna coast and we're gonna do our thing that's fine, but that's not. It's it was against the antithesis, against the theos of, of who I am. What I am is is moving forward, taking chances, investing time, energy, resources to eventually reap the benefits. And I think that's what that's what Dana White and the UFC have done. Man, they they you saw it during the pandemic. Dana White was the first person to get on the microphone and say, "We will be back. We will yeah. be the first sport back." And you know, guys like. Guys like I mean, it was it was uh, Justin Gaethje, Tony Ferguson headlined that that first card, and those guys were waiting in the wings. And I'm over here in Bellator, last fight on my contract, worldwide pandemic, waiting. Man, when am I going to get the fight? I and wanna... that's when fighting is growing. I mean, fighting it itself like was growing at that point. Like yeah. I started to learn a lot more about Bellator. Like Nick Davis is our producer back in L.A., and he's a huge uh, degenerate gambler and MMA fan, yeah. and. Um, but he's always like he knows every fighter from top to bottom of every organization. But he started getting me into different Bellator fights. He's like, you got to watch this. That's um, cool. So it's and even then, yeah, fighting like was growing. And so it is interesting, kind of that maybe were you was Bellator missing some opportunities to grab onto some of that market share, even if UFC was the one that was kind of leading it. Hundred percent, one one thousand percent. Because even even though you know they're different organizations, and and I think Bellator. I think Bellator, it, of course, they used, you know, they used the coronavirus, a pandemic in which the whole world right now, if, if you, you know, order a T-shirt offline and it takes an extra two weeks, all they got to say is, well, it's COVID. And oh, it's of crazy. The, everything. It's like, you know, it's like, like we were saying, like you can go <laughs> freaking rear in somebody be like, oh man, I'm sorry, dude. You know, COVID and yeah, hey, I got COVID, coronavirus. It's like, I got, you know, <laughs> coronavirus. So it's like everybody can use that and, and not to downplay, you know, the disease, but people can use coronavirus right now as 
as a oh, totally a, a, an excuse for anything. And, oh, and I told a girl I could get an erection. I was like, oh, yeah, I got yeah, coronavirus. Exactly. You know? Coronavirus in my penis. <laughs> She's like, damn, that's Just nervous crazy. about coronavirus. I had yeah. somewhere else. But. She was a nice girl too, actually, man. <laughs> she fucking took care of me for like two weeks, hoping it would get better, and it didn't. I was like, oh, damn. Maybe it wasn't <laughs> coronavirus. She brought you soup. Yeah. yeah, it might just be erectile dysfunction. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it is interesting to, to, to see how they haven't maybe – it maybe haven't picked up a lot of like uh, or just haven't grown their own business and maybe they have i don't know but you didn't feel like they, they were no they have and, and they have grown and they've they've built and and that was the thing about it like i was i was content too and, and i said this i i knew i was probably going to make a change but i would have been happy as well getting a really great offer from bellator and 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 retiring there and doing all that and maybe maybe that was true maybe I, maybe it was just a little bit of negotiation tactic but there was part of me that 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 said man i i I cared about those guys. I cared. I cared about building that organization. That that organization is not who they are without my fights with Eddie Alvarez. Oh man, Benson Henderson. Me losing to Will Brooks and then fight, coming. Who was that Brent pigskin guy you lost to? What was that guy's name? Pigskin. No, what was his nickname? Punch. Uh, Punch dog or something. Pitbull. 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 Punch yeah, sorry. Dog. I didn't know. Punch I didn't know who it dog. was. But, yeah, something uh, like that. Exactly. Did you feel bad? Did you feel? Were you bummed that you didn't get to fight him again before you left? No, and that's that's the beautiful thing about it. I I've never really I'm not about because to me it's not the person and and trust me I there's no more animosity that I've ever had with any of my opponents than him because he's made some baseless claims about me using PEDs and just this kind of silly stuff that has no there's there's no and he has warmth. a brother that does it even like a stunt double or something like a oh, twin yeah. brother yeah, that's insane for sure, for sure and they're both they're both from Brazil they if anything they you know probably oh, have, have sure. dabbled and it's like. So I'm not really worried some about it. Some lace fucking papaya down yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. Sure. So, so we've had we had some you know our our interactions where we don't really like each other. But to me, I'm like I don't need to get that one back. I don't care. The funny thing is, I'm in a much better position right now, getting ready to fight. I'm one I'm one degree of separation away from fighting That's for the crazy. UFC title. I will be UFC champion by July of 2021. So you think I'm worried about his little self? And no, how yeah. Disgruntled he is. He's not. He's not happy about his contract. He's not happy about his promotion or where he's at or what he's doing he's just an unhappy person and he wanted to throw shade at me because he has a scarcity mindset where i whereas i have an abundance mindset wow. and there's and it's very important to distinguish the two a scarcity mindset says because you are having success that that is going to take away from the success that i could possibly grab because there's a pie there's a pie and there's only so much of it Man, there's an abundance of of money there's an abundance of success there's an abundance of impact out there for you to grab and your success does nothing to take away from my success that I'm allowed to have or able to have. And there's that's a lot of people. Yeah, that's out huge, there like man. That. And I've struggled with that in my own su success, like getting more successful and then getting scared, you know, yeah. and oper operating from a place of fear. Man, um, that's, it's very, and, and it's, it's the, it's the wounds of our past, the, the, the stories that we've told ourselves. Man, I've, I've told myself so many stories inside my head that where I would just sabotage myself and give myself permission to lose instead of permission to, to win permission wow. to be successful. You know, I grew out of it after college, luckily. Um, uh, but I just underperformed so much in college that I said, man, I got to stop this. I got to figure something out. I got to take extreme ownership of what's going on in, be in between these years. Like you are what you are and where you are because of what has gone into your mind and the stories and the, and the, the myths and the, the trends that you tell yourself over, you know, your 30 year life, your 40 year life, your 15 year old life, whatever it may be. And man, you gotta, you gotta kick that in the teeth. Here's a guy right here who has a question right here. Hey, Mike and Theo, it's Aaron from Oklahoma city. Well, this is a question for both of you, I guess, Theo, you already have one, but Mike, would you ever consider growing a Nebraska oh, Nick man. warmer? Damn. He got that work, huh? That bromane, Dude, that baby, hanging good, off the man. back. That's nice and nice and. Uh, did he straighten that? He may have straightened. He also may have dyed it a little, which I don't <laughs> mind. Baby. What did he call it? Uh, Nebraska. What that did he call skunk it? dip. I don't know what it is. Uh, what's that call? He called it the Nebraska. Nebraska or Can you Oklahoma. Play the end of that for us again, Riley. Yes, Theo, you already have one, but Mike, would you ever consider growing a Nebraska Nick warmer? Nebraska, Nebraska neck, neck warmer. warmer, baby. That's good. Have man. you ever tried to, uh, you know, to increase your flair by doing something wild like that? You ever do a rat tail or something? I could see you with a rat tail, man. I could, I could do a rat tail. Now, I, I mean, I haven't, I haven't really. I mean, the, I did have a haircut that was kind of a little edgy. You know, when that movie, the Fu you know, Fury, came out with Brad Pitt. Mm, I don't know. Brad if I do. Pitt, where he's a tank war. He's Can the you pull tank. Up that picture. Do you mind, Riley? 
uh, he's the tank uh, operator, and he's got like four other guys, three other guys, Shia LaBeouf and some young guy, and Michael Sa- uh, Michael Sarah, Michael Sarah, Michael Sarah, the skinny little white guy. Yeah, no, not him, Michael Pena, the like uh, the, oh, the Latino guy. Latino yeah, guy, he's like, hilarious. Yeah, he's awesome. Greatest haircut of all time, dude. And you know he's got freaking, you know he's got plugs in in the front or something where he got a hair hair transplant. Oh yeah, I've had that. Line. Yeah, I got it. Did you really? Yeah. Got it some worked? of the mullet taken out of the back and put into the front, bro. Does it ever fall out? Unprecedented. I don't know. I don't even know if it ever even came in. That's the problem. They they your hairline's like your hairline's perfect though, right? They put you to sleep and then they or they don't put you to sleep, but they take it out of the back and they put it into the front. And with so, a robot? Uh, no, I have it do them hand by hand. That's some fucking robot back there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's him. I have a fucking mustache. Oh, don't don't record this right now because I are you <laughs> recording? <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I have a mustache about one I've of my eyes. Because I thought about it, man. Like, I got a freaking receding hairline yeah, bad. You could do it easy, man. It's a real easy process. That's cool. I thought about trying to find somebody locally that would uh, do it pro bono, you know, yeah. just to talk about it. I mean, there's, everybody's had it done. There's there's a, a place. There's wegrowhair.com. Oh, I've seen the I've seen the yeah, billboard. You see the billboards, yeah, right? Yeah, I, I Tons of billboards. <laughs> we grow hair. That just sounds we vague as hair. fuck, dog. <laughs> I'm not trying to find a sharecropper. I'm trying to find somebody. But see, this is important. This up. is important for for our you know like our like you know 30, 40 age oh, demographic yeah. where it's like man you know a lot of people got some got some hair like look at the one look at Brad Pitt right there in his tuxedo man like look at that hairline that is absolutely perfect. Yeah, go click on that, uh, Riley, please. He's from Missouri, man. You know. Wow. But but anyway, so that was probably the most uh, that was probably the most kind of statement of a haircut I ever made. Is, is I kind of did the fury for a little while until my receding hairline started creeping up too much, and I was like, ah man, it's not working anymore. I got to go with this faux hawk thing. Yeah, faux hawk's good though. <laughs> it's long right now. I got to get a haircut. But so yeah, so that's about as as wild as you would go in the hair world. Yeah, I think um, so. I'm gonna ask you. Let me ask you about um. And sorry if Riley seems a little off. Riley just had his first kiss, actually, the other day. Yeah, Kissed a girl for Riley? the first time. Really? Yeah. What's her name, man? Um, Wait, are we Maddie. Maddie? Yeah. Okay. You like her? Well, let's just say I did. You did? <clears throat> what? Something happened? Oh, yeah. Uh, last night, I found out. Yeah. It was, it was that she bad. kissed another guy? Oh, um, way more than that. Oh, gosh. Oh my God, man! I'm sorry, dude. I didn't know that, and we, unfortunately, we didn't. Have, we don't have you on mic today either, Riley. I'm sorry about that, but man, well, you had a first kiss. Yeah, long time ago. Who was it, bro? Who was it? Be honest, dog. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't remember. Like, oh I, come like, on, man. <laughs> Brandy. I think it was Brandy with an eye. Oh yeah, bro. <laughs> Brandy with an eye always kiss people, dude. Brandy with an eye <laughs> yeah. is the most Missouri. Is that where you're from, Missouri? Yeah, Missouri is man. the most St. Missouri High type Ridge. of name. Brandy ever, with an bro. eye. <laughs> Brandy with an eye lives close to the interstate, bro. <laughs> I know that. Dude. Brandy with an eye. She used to. Uh, she used to invite all the rich girls into. She used to invite the rich girls over, and they'd ride bikes out, and they'd get in fights with the the, the other kids, <laughs> oh, yeah. the poor kids. My kind of girl. <laughs> Brandy with an eye. I, my first one was Chrissy with an eye. Chrissy, hello. Chrissy with an eye would come out of the woodwork and her beat up mongoose. <laughs> like, what's up, girl? You're on the wrong side of the tracks. <laughs> it was yeah, Chrissy scullions. with an eye, bro. <laughs> Christy with an eye. Damn. So Riley, man, it fell apart, huh? Yeah, it did. Oh. So, you, how do you feel about it? Are you all right? Are you? Keeping it together. That's good. Man. Well, thanks for being here today, man. I didn't know that that had happened, and we'll discuss it next time. Um, and we'll sorry you had to be here to learn about that news as well, Mike. Yeah, what the heck, man. But it's not you, man. It's her, you know? It's definitely her. It's her loss, man. Um, here's a young fella right here. Who it's that's Post Malone, dude. That could be Post Malone. Be gang, Post gang. Malone. This one's for Mike. I'm just wondering how long does it take to get that freaking insanely ripped? Is it something that... Um, it's always been with you or at one point when you started to fight, you know, and do what you're doing in training, did you notice it happening over time? And if so, how long? Gang, gang. Gang, brother. Gang. Yeah, you're the, when I envision you being born, this is what I envision. I envision you come out of the womb, you turn around, and then you start doing the ropes exercise <laughs> with your own umbilical cord. Yeah. That's I exactly like that. what I envision. I like that. No, I think that's pretty much how it happened. Uh, <laughs> no, I, uh, who got you into fitness? 
I mean, I just, I, it was a, it was a, it was a byproduct of what I have to do, you know? And I, I just truly believe, and I, and I get this all the time. Like people will see me squatting heavy or bench pressing heavy or doing some dynamic stuff. And people are like, Oh my God, I'm, my knees hurt just watching that. Or my yeah. back hurts just watching this. And I just, I feel for people cause I, I don't know what position they're in or what their background is or how much they have or haven't worked out. But I truly believe I've wrestled, I wrestled for, um, 12 years or whatever. And now I've been fighting now for 11 and whatever it is. 20, the last 20 years I've been wrestling and then now fighting. And I have very few injuries. And I think a lot of it has to do with, I think there's a genetic component. There's a luck component. Of course, I'm never going to, never going to act like there isn't, but lifting weights, heavy external force of adding weights and, and lifting heavy and bulletproofing your body through strength and conditioning has really made my body, you know, very, very dense. I think my bone density is very, very high and I get very few injuries because of strength training. So mm -hmm. I just loved it. And I realized if I can put, put in the work in the weight room, it's going to bulletproof my body inside those wrestling matches, inside those wrestling practices, and now inside the mixed martial arts world. And so I've been doing it since college. I mean, college, we lifted two, three days a week, heavy, hard, intense. And then we were wrestling six days a week. So my body just became a machine, but you know, to answer his question, it takes me about 12 weeks, you know, um, to get primed up, to get completely primed up, you know, to go from, you know, 10%, but I never get above 10% body fat. And that's one of the things about mixed martial arts. People are like, Oh, he walks around at 198 and cuts down to 155 or 190 and cuts down to 155. And it's like, yeah, but how fat is he? How, how chunky is he? You know, we can all have a propensity to get chunky and get heavy. But for me, I keep, I keep my weight around 180 two to 187 max usually right around 183 to 185 um and 10 body fat you know because i just don't like to get that Damn. far out of shape and then it takes me 12 weeks of discipline to shrink my body a little bit obviously a lot of get rid of a lot of body fat or probably six percent get down to about four or five six percent body fat lose a little bit of muscle and then get down to 155 Damn, dude. I freaking, I think I ate 10% body fat last night, honestly. <laughs> yeah, um, so did I. Yeah, okay, feel better. Good. good. <laughs> um, when you're in, uh, when you're in uh, Dubai, right? That's where the fight Abu Dhabi. Was? Sorry, when but you're in right Abu Dhabi and, and it's getting close to fight time, did you have an inkling? Are you getting word from people there that both guys are making the fight? Like, are you, is there a point where it starts to feel like, okay, I might actually be a, a real substitute or, and then it goes from, okay, this is, I'm just going to be here. Yeah. I mean, I, it wasn't until the day before weigh-ins that my man, that my manager even kind of asked, you know, and then even then the UFC was essentially like, well, I, I would imagine, you know, by, by the morning after fight fight or the morning after weigh-ins, the day at the morning of the fight, by the time that we get word that Habib and Gaethje both passed their COVID test and they're negative, you know, you, you should be pretty good to go. And then they were like, well, but actually... Like, what if they get hurt on the way to the arena? It was one of those deals where I was essentially just the backup all the way until those guys stepped into the cage. Wow. At that point, I, you know, had pizza for lunch because, I mean, what was I going to do? Like, just continue to eat chicken and broccoli all the way till 9 p.m.? And No. You know, at that point, you kind of just look foolish. Like, you're just kind of You can't just hang like, out outside of the ring like no. going like this. Yeah, exactly. You know? Exactly. And it's one of those things, too, where it's like, it would be an even better story. I, I also, like, of course we joked, of like, with my manager, my manager, longtime manager, Randall Allman was there, who um, I'm good friends with, but he also handles my stuff. So we were there, and it was like, man, we should just, you know, go, like, have a celebratory beer or celebratory, you know, have drink before this and be like, well, yeah, but what if I get the call? Joking and be like, well, it would kind of be a cool, even better story. <laughs> be a great story. Even better story. I got the call while, you know, they just poured a Stella or something, you yeah. know, and I'm eating a pizza. Chandler beat Khabib after two Mai Tais. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like crazy. You know, like, so I didn't end up having an alcoholic beverage that day until after the fights were over or whatever, but it would have been, it was, we were just joking, like it would have been an even better story. And who, it, who and, would, who, go, sorry, go oh, ahead. No, I say, and, and in some ways it would probably make me fight even better because I'd be like, I got nothing to lose for sure. Because yeah, I just yeah, had, a, yeah. you know, two Mai Tais and a, <laughs> and some you still have the bar shrimp. type receipt in your in <laughs> yeah. your short. Um, who would you? Uh, was there a rather where you're like, if you started to think like, who would I rather fight? I I my answer to that is, I I love I would love the idea of fighting both of them, but at that point you have to fight Khabib just because he's the number one guy. Oh wow, and, really? Yeah, because if you're gonna fight. I mean, yeah, it, it would be better to have a 12-week training camp focused just on Habib, obviously, when you have the opportunity of a lifetime to, to 
you know, beat an undefeated fighter, the best fighter in lightweight history and get the world title. Um, but for me, you got to take the opportunities when you can, they don't just hand out UFC, you know, title fights like it's nothing. So, um, for me, it, w- it would have been Habib just because I would have had the opportunity to, to capture the belt that night. Uh, and a fight with me and Justin Gaethje is going to happen. Just like I said, a fight with me and Poya is going to happen. These fights are going to happen. But so if you had the opportunity, and I knew, we all knew Habib, we didn't know he was going to retire that night, or at least say he's going to retire. We don't know yet. But I thought for sure he's going to have one, maybe two fights left in him. So you want to, I want to get that fight before Damn. he retires. I would not want to get that fight, but I but I, but that's, I that's a different mindsets, man. Now, is when you're there and you're in that environment, is there a level of royalty that kind of precedes and surrounds Khabib that doesn't surround anybody else in a way? No, I yeah, I'm not I'm not really I'm not, not really, that you're thinking of, but do you feel is there anything like that in the air? No, I'm just wondering. Well, like, he he wasn't there that much to be honest with you. Like I saw Justin Gaethje a couple times. His, his mom and dad were there. His brothers. His brother looks just like him. They're all from Arizona. They're kind of doing their thing. Man, me and Justin Gaethje are very similar. Man, small town, blue collar wrestling families. Like that's it looked like my family walking around if we were in in, in Abu Dhabi at, at a at a hotel somewhere. So he was there. He was present and he was seen a lot had a couple conversations with him or his team or whatever. Habib was no nowhere to be found. Habib had like his own training facility. He had his own hotel. He had his own everything. He showed up in armored cars and motorcades and helicopters and all kinds of stuff. So he is like royalty over there because it's the Middle East. It's close to Russia. He's he's uh Muslim, you know, so he's he's like royalty. So there there is, but for me as like a red, white, and blue blooded American, I'm like, this is silly, man. You right. know? It's like whatever you know right. so but you got to respect it now i don't i don't want to i don't want that to come off like i don't respect him like i respect him a ton as a competitor inside the cage what he's done his accomplishments plus winning his last fight after the loss of his father oh, yeah. and, and all that kind of stuff i respect him respect the heck out of him for that but for the most part it was like that's eh, it's just like all right bro and i don't know he showed up he looked like a skeleton at weigh-ins he looked like it was it was questionable whether he even made weight wow you know and you're just like dude be a professional. Make the weight. Show up with your chest puffed out and a smile on your face. Do your job. He yeah, like, there's a video where it says it looks like they didn't even check his weight, kind of. Did supposedly you, they did, you know. Did you, I mean, <clears throat> do you, does that seem normal to you? Did it feel? I mean, I will say, I will say Daniel Cormier brought this up, and it is true. They, at the hotel, I had to step on the scale, and I weighed 154.9. And uh, then they said, okay, you can get on the bus. So if I was 155.2 or whatever there, they might have been like, no, you know, you can't get on the bus until you cut the weight. Then again, maybe Habib was like, I'm right at 155.1. By the time I get over there, I can float 0.1. Maybe the scale, it's a, a lot of times your balance scales, you know, those old school balance scales Mm -hmm. are a little bit more lenient than your digital scale because a digital scale will tell you point, boom, whatever it is. Right. The balance scale, all they have to do is have a little bit of daylight and you're technically in there. So there's almost like a point two uh, swing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, he stepped on the scale. It was going up. They swiped it. and But it's, you know. It, it's conspiracy it is. theory. Nah, I mean, it, it's, it's man, they, they've been doing this for 26, 27 years. You know, there hasn't been many controversies. So whatever. It wasn't meant to be for me to step inside that cage tonight. Nor, nor would I have. If Khabib didn't make weight at that moment, he would have got time to cut weight anyway. So I wasn't worried about it. Um, here's a question right here from a young fella right here. What up, Theo? It's your boy Brody from Spartanburg, South Carolina. Calling with a question from Michael Chandler. How you keep your head held high after an ass whipping? That's something I want to know. Gang, baby, love you. Love you too, bro. Well, I know it's for Michael, but I'll tell you, I I remember when I was in school, I've told this story before, but they, some kid beat my ass, right? Which is easy to do. (laughs) If I was somebody else, I would beat my ass. You know what I'm saying, (laughs) bro? So don't take a lot of clout out of it, you know? (laughs) Like easy, dude. I was, it was easy to beat my ass. But, uh, but afterwards at school, they made us stand in the hall, me and the kid that beat my ass and hope, put our arms on each other's shoulders. And we had to stand like that all day in the hall. So then like. I ended up becoming friends with the guy. 
He's still a friend of mine today. This kid Brad Castleman, great guy. No way. Um, yeah, and it wasn't that good of. I let him. I let him hit me a couple, first three or four times. I let him hit me, dude. dude. Right? And then I fell down, bro. That was my. So fucking, you didn't get in trouble. You just had to do that. For, we had to do that, dude. That's yeah. cool, dude. That's. But it was interesting because by the end of the day, we were friends, dude. You're you like, know? well, we gotta sit, so, say, oh man, what, what, so what do you like to do for fun? Yeah, you know? yeah <laughs> totally, bro. That was it, bro. You're like, man, totally like it. I know I hated you this morning, but like, dude, I really hate Brad. I really hate Joe. <laughs> yeah. You know, like. Yeah, let's go fuck Joe. him. Up. Yeah, we should go fight Joe, man. No. Bro, come over. I'll invite you over this weekend. Yeah, yeah. I got a rich kid coming over. Yeah. Why don't you come over and help He's me? He's coming out? over in his real shiny yellow haro with the gyro over on the front and pegs. Yeah, and his duck head freaking <laughs> shirt and shorts. Um, what, uh, what, uh, what? That's a good question, though. How do you keep? Question. How do you maintain some composure and keep your head up after a loss? Man, I think uh, kind of like what we were talking earlier is it's it's all about the process too. You know, if whenever you realize that the journey is really the process, you know, like the process is the goal. The journey is the goal, realizing that you're going to have wins, you're going to have losses. And I realized over the last couple of years, and it took me a while to realize this, that every single person that I've ever looked up to, whether I know them or there's, or, or there's some sports figures, some icon, I'm like, man, that person, I respect them. They all have losses in their past. They've all have ups. They all have downs. Every single person you've ever looked up to who has one, has at one point or another been a failure failure of a competition, failure of failure of something. So when you realize like my next fight, I might lose. I don't know, but don't be afraid of the loss. Don't be afraid of it. But when I have lost for me, it's the, it's, it's the beauty of it being the most embarrassing, one of the most embarrassing moments of your life. Cause it's not like you lost a, a, a baseball game. It's not like you lost a football game and you just lost a fight. You know, you just got bested by another individual who is getting their hand raised while you have to hang your head or your and, and collect half a paycheck and go home and lick your wounds. Um, but I think it's just, once again, realizing that losses are part of the journey. Right. You know, lick your wounds, get around the most important people in your life, be around the people that love you, be around the people that believe in you, be, be around the people that love you, whether you win or lose, make sure you stay built up. And then take notes on how you can get better, how you can, how you can become a better man, competitor, woman, whatever it may be. Wow. Man, dude, I wish you lived in my head, bro. That would be hey, helpful. Bro, I live, well, we live in the same city now. That's a good least, point, so, dude. You know? It's close, man. It's, <laughs> it's, get, pretty it's close. getting closer. It's pretty close. Exactly. Yeah, it's definitely getting closer. <laughs> uh, here's a question right here that we have from a young man. What up, Theo gang, brother? Hey, uh, what up, Michael? Hope you're doing well. Hope your brain works all right. Uh, mine doesn't. You know, nine concussions and whatnot. But mm. I imagine yeah. you feel similar sometimes. Anyways, I was wondering someone who's like just getting into fighting and stuff and like wanting to have that ability of of, of true self defense, not just swinging and wailing. Um, if if all I'm doing is watching these videos, right, and not going to any classes or anything like that, what would you say is the number one thing to pay attention to? Some of the takeaways that someone who is overall like a YouTube type learner, how can, what can I do to take away from from actual legitimate professional fights that would help me? If I were to get in some sort of, you know, scrapple dapple out here on these streets, because it gets tough out here in the Central East sometimes. Amen, uh, bro. You know. So, uh, yeah, man, just wondering what some of that advice might be. I uh, love what you guys do. Keep it up. Theo, you the man. Gang, gang, brother. Gang, Let's brother. keep rolling. Amen. Let's keep rolling, man. That's a good love question, it. man, because a lot of net bangers out there, they call them when fools going wild, they call them net bangers. And it's just mean like people that are learned just doing stuff only on the net, not in real time. Mm -hmm. But that's a great question, man. Nine concussions. Damn, bro. Yeah, you fucking thinking with a Rubik's Cube at that point. You know? <laughs> yeah, no rough. no offense, bud. But um, but yeah, that's a great question, Michael. What do you got? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of people and you've talked about there's a lot of people learning things through YouTube these days. But I mean, when are you when you're watching fights? Whether it's, you know, hopefully it's professional fights, you know, so you're you're learning from professionals, if you will. Um, man, defense is underrated. You know, keep your hands up. Uh, learning. Watch, watch how in a fight people use the distance and the timing. A lot of times it's not necessarily the biggest punch that lands, the, the one that they see coming. It's the one that they don't see coming because you timed it perfectly. Yeah. So when you watch some of these crazy knockouts where a guy's looking looking at you this way, ex expecting you to throw that jab, but the hook comes here and hits him in the in the in the chin from a, almost a, a side the side, you know. The tit the distance, the timing, defense, um, and then the space between the two, the spatial awareness of of the, the fighters, whether they're uh, going in for a takedown and then throwing an uppercut or looking like they're going to, 
throw a, a head strike and then go for the takedown. You know, I mean, obviously, I don't know if my man's looking to get into mixed martial arts fighting in professional rings or if he's just, like he said, you know, in the streets. I guess he was saying in the streets, just have a little bit of a self defense. But can you learn from up. YouTube, or do you have to get out there and practice? I think fighting, you need to be. That's something you need to need to be there in, in the physical, like in in person. I would say, you know, like obviously. You know, you can. Yeah, learn. you can't wash some shit on your phone and then go fight. I mean, no, it's gonna I mean, be harder. You it is. Can. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, you, there's something to be said for fighters like myself who uh, who I watch film and then I can like almost learn through osmosis and say, man, okay, in my next sparring session, I'm gonna try this. But without that sparring session, it was just, you know, and it's also real time. It's fast. The, the craziest thing about fighting is it's just so fast. Yeah. You're constantly reaction time. And you only get that reaction time through 10,000 hours of repetition and getting after it. So you got to be there there in the physical form. I don't know if they're in the Central East, if his, if his MMA gyms are open now because of the pandemic, but man, get somewhere and get some drills in. You know, in America, we have uh, sometimes traditions that, you know, are half, half-handed or haphazard and old-fashioned. And it's kind of wild to think that a lot of people are still wiping their buttocks instead of washing it after they go to the toilet or do toilet. Hello Tushy cleans your butt with a precise stream of fresh water for just $79. I mean, let's be honest with each other. For years, bidets have been available, but hideously expensive, costing thousands of dollars. You see a bidet, maybe, uh, you know, Jeff Bazos has one. Or, you know, Richie Rich's daddy has a uh, bidet. But times have changed. Because with Hello Tushy, you don't wipe at all. Wiping is over. Even the best two-ply just can't cut it when it comes to a hands-free booty cleaning experience. Ditch paper products and uncomfortable chafing when you switch to the soothing, cleansing stream of water from a Hello Tushy bidet attachment. And every Hello Tushy bidet attachment comes with a 60-day risk-free guarantee and a 12-month warranty. Join millions of happy Hello Tushy customers right now and have a clean butt with every flush. That's right. Go to hellotushy.com slash T-H-E-O to get 10% off. This is a special offer. For our listeners, clean your booty right. Clean your booty right. Go to hellotushy.com slash Theo for 10% off hellotushy.com slash Theo. Um, so when you see you see like the fight between Dustin and uh, Connor is supposed to happen, right? Mm -hmm. um, is there a preference? And I watched you the other day. You were talking about like a top 10 guys and kind of rating the top 10. Just just yep. sharing your thoughts on them, you know? And yep. I thought it was really real eloquent about it and shared some nice thoughts about all the guys. Um, um, is there like a fight that you really want? Is there a fight that you... Does it change day to day, week to week? Like uh, a month ago, if I'd have asked you, was it a different person than today? So a month ago, if you would have asked me, I would have said, you know, it's Tony Ferguson. Um, but then after Habib was talking about retiring and then Justin Gaethje was talking about fighting within six to eight weeks. And then also Connor and Poirier were talking about fighting at 170. Dana White has made it very clear. If those guys are fighting at 170, they're not going to be, you know, they obviously aren't going to be getting a title shot, you know, anytime soon. Um, as soon as Habib retired, you know, I was like, Hey man, I'll fight Justin Gaethje next week for the title. Six weeks from now, November, December. Fuck, I'll fight him at the breakfast buffet <laughs> yeah, in the morning. Yeah, I'll fight him next tomorrow morning before the plane takes <laughs> yeah. off. You know, like, let's just keep the, keep the octagon set up. Let's go. Uh, you know, so, so that was then. So at that point you're that you're like, yeah, I'll, so Khabib's retired. That kind of changed things. It changed things. And I said, Hey, I'll fight, I'll fight Dustin or uh, I'll fight Tony or Gaethje for you know whether it's a number one contender spot or whether it's for the title because you had connor and and poirier talking about fighting 170 so they right. were almost out of the discussion <clears throat> still right now you have connor and poirier looks like it's almost done it looks like they're gonna be fighting at 155 so those two are booked you got gaethje who just fought so chances are he might want a little bit of time off so i think tony ferguson i, I say tony ferguson for two reasons number one he makes the most sense because he's been the guy who sat out the longest and secondly if I if I do think Habib is coming back, I would say he's beaten Connor. Habib has beaten Connor. He's beaten Poirier. He's beaten Gaethje now, and he the only fight left out there for him was the Ferguson fight. But if I beat Ferguson, I leapfrog Ferguson, and now you get Chandler Habib for his thirty and zero fight or twenty nine and one fight, 
instead of Tony Ferguson. Wow. So that kind of gives me the best option to to win, leapfrog him, fight a top five guy, and be the most appealing matchup, the most challenging matchup for Habib Magomedov. Wow. Was it disappointing um, when... And have you talked to Tony about it? You guys had some exchange about it, right? We had an exchange a little bit. Um, and then even he he commented on one of my Instagram posts, like, train hard, see you soon, you know, yeah. CSO. He's his... such a unique guy. He's such like a... Yeah, he's such a he is. anomaly kind. He's of. an anomaly. He's yeah. a unique guy. You don't know. You don't know. You don't know what he's gonna say, and then you also don't know, don't know what he's gonna yeah, do inside the cage. Wow. Yeah. You know, so it's wild, and it's just like, I think it's a perfect. It's it's a fight that scares me. You know, so it's a fight that's great. You know, it's great for me. It's great for great introduction for me. So he's a top five guy. He's a scary guy. He was twelve and zero before or he was on a twelve fight win streak. But before he lost his last fight, we can't forget that. Like he's still. One of the most dangerous guys in the division, definitely the most unpredictable guy. In the division. And how quickly that gets forgotten after the Gaethje fight? So isn't it, quick. Isn't a crazy? I mean, how quickly suddenly he's like he seems wa- like there's this uh, you know yeah he's not the same guy exactly. And and granted he took a lot of damage in that fight, yeah. but still Jesus. man like we we all take damage you know we all win or lose we take damage you know uh, so it's just it is a very much and that's the hardest thing about it. But I think it's also the most beautiful thing about it because. The, some of the fans do realize what us fighters have to go through, like that our head is on the chopping block essentially every single time we fight. Where it's like, man, it's it's a what have you done for me lately business. But going back to like you were talking about Poirier, it's like it's cool to see his he, he's he's become a hero, win or lose. He's been one of those guys who are going to come in if he wins, people love him. If he loses, people are rooting for him, wanting him to pick himself back up and, and get back in the win column. And I looked at myself that kind of same way. I'm gonna I'm gonna come into the UFC no matter what. I might have. You know, five fights left in me, 12 fights left in me. But either way, there's a bunch of big fights out there for me to just have a blast, to be put on this, you know, awesome platform. Who knows? I could go 500 the next six fights. I could go 8 0 my next eight fights. I could win the title and hold it for 10 years. I don't know. You know, so we'll see. It's wild, man. It's a crazy sport. It's, and, and it's so, it's amazing. Really, that 155 is, I mean, it's really almost the best. I mean, it's, is there any division that has that much? That many individual guys who are, have so much, just like you're saying, they can all fight. They could all stay in that in the top ten for the next five, ten years. Yeah, I I don't think so. Not not when it comes to, to divisions. You know, you got your individual guys, and and then you got a guy like Israel Adesanya who's who fights at 185. Now he's going up to fight for the title at 205. Crazy. And John Jones just left 205, went to heavyweight. And as Adesanya is talking about going up to heavyweight, so that right there kind of shows you that there's not a ton of depth in some of these. And I don't say that like they're still. It's sometimes the depth that sometimes it looks like there's a lack of depth because the champion has beaten all the one, number one contenders, similar right. to like kind of how Khabib has done. But and Jones too. Jones, there was nobody left yeah. from really. He was fighting guys two and three times. Exactly. Like. But but you look at all the guys that Jones fought, and if Jones, if we take Jones out of the picture and he retired tomorrow like Khabib did, you immediately start looking at Dominic Reyes and Jan Blavovich and um, the guy with the Thor hammer on his chest. He fights this weekend. Uh, um, Santos, Tiago Santos, you know, um, just a ton of big name guys, you know, so it's big name guys, but they looked not that great against a guy like John Jones, you know, so Alexander Gustafson, if you, yeah, will, you I know? love him. Exactly. So, but man, look at the light, look at the lightweight division. Connor is the anchor. He's the, the biggest name, obviously. You got me, the new guy who came in, who came in right at the right time. Tony Ferguson, who's a household name. Poirier, who's a household name. Justin Gaethje, who is a household name and, I mean, you've gotten thrown in. I mean, you suddenly like, does it feel a lot different being Michael Chandler two months ago who was uh, in just, you know, in the, not the XFL because it's certainly a lot bigger than that. That's a shitty comparison, but. It's it's similar. I mean, it's it's not, it's not the NFL, you know. Right. Yeah. Being adjacent, right. Being UFC adjacent to suddenly, I mean, this is, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's definitely like it's like put you in a star spot in a way you yeah, know it is it's cool and it, and and it and a lot of it or some of it had to do with the way that i came over and and the i guess even even i did, I did bruce buffer's podcast and he's like hey he's like, like michael wow, you know exactly cool. yeah, it's time podcast bruce buffer was like hey you know i've been with the ufc now for 25 years and i'm hard pressed to rack in my brain trying to think of a, another free agent that came over and got this much splash and this much you know momentum and part of that is great but part of that also you know uh kind of 
exposes you to, to some hate too because people are like who's this guy think he is man why is the ufc why are they force feeding us mike this michael chandler guy yeah, who's this but, pretty boy too yeah exactly well that's part of it too they're like this guy doesn't look yeah, like who's this handsome ass. guy who's this lifeguard i, I read one comment <laughs> who's this lifeguard <laughs> lifeguard like, exactly that's i'm like dang man i know but it's like do man, you even know cpr honestly yeah, no i don't unbelievable bro. exactly what man fucking... it's, i can't even swim yeah, no <laughs> it's like you know but the good thing is, I will get into the octagon soon, and people will realize, okay, will he's see. not just a bo- the bodyguard, lifeguard looking dude, whatever, and bodybuilder. Freaking, someone called me a fitness model because I, you know, the UFC took some photos of me on the beach, and I'm like, what am I supposed to do, man? I'm out here on Fight Island. I'm probably not going to fight. Let me do something. You know, like, yeah. uh, so it's one of them deals where you know, it, just do a little bit of research. Look up my fights on YouTube. Yeah, I've lost. But I've also won. I've won in dominant fashion. You'll, you'll see. You'll see the passion that that I bring to the cage and being bring to that, and I will bring to that octagon. So it's uh, because this it is, feels this, much bigger. A lot of people. This is their first introduction to your name. Exactly. So it does, and it does feel much bigger. It does. You know, the the numbers are growing. The the notoriety is growing, and, and in a lot of ways, it, it it inspires me and motivates me to to be better, to to work even harder, to That's cool. to build even more. You know, because like I said. It wasn't enough for me to just put on the UFC gloves and put on the UFC fight kit and take the photos and in front of the UFC green screen and get on the UFC broadcast. Like, man, I want to get inside that octagon. And I want to fight and I want to prove, to, not prove, I want to show the people who I am. Win, lose, or draw, that's that's going to take care of itself. Yeah. Well, but the passion that I bring to the, to the octagon, the preparation and the manner in which I prepare myself is is all going to stay the same, if if not be even more increased right now. And... I'm excited for the opportunity. How big is that white chair there in in uh, in um, Abu Dhabi? The white chair at the yeah that big white chair at the UFC thing. Isn't there like a big white chair out there that people are sitting in? In the W, at the um at the hotel in, in Abu Dhabi. Yeah, at the UFC ring at the ring out there. Didn't they have oh, like a? I didn't see a white chair. You didn't? Uh. Uh-uh. I've just seen pictures of people sitting in one. Um, Did you see the picture? Was it like a a wooden white chair on yeah. the beach? On the beach. Yeah, it looks real big. It is big. It is. It is. It's really big and it's really deep. Because I was like trying to lean back and I couldn't. I got short legs. Don't tell anybody. I, I got some short What's legs. What's anything, man? man. I, I mean, I've watched a lot of hours of footage of you. you can, <laughs> I got some freaking short t- legs. You can I tell have, they're not extremely long. Yeah. But yeah. Me and my, I mean, we have a, we have a big couch in my house too. And I was like, gosh, dang, I hate these long couches, man. Because <laughs> if I get my my low back up against the back of the couch, my my little feet dangle like, off. you know, like you're waiting for Christmas morning. Yeah, man. like oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> Mom and dad, you know. Um, is there a fighter you think that that would that doesn't want to fight you in that in that top group? I will say for a lot of guys, it's risky because you're that new element. It's yeah. like, and you're coming from a different place where I mean, I'm sure all the guys are familiar with you for sure, but it's not what they've been looking at. It's not their you know when they're looking yeah. at their top ten, it's not what they've been looking at. The problem with mixed martial arts is not the problem. It's just the nature of mixed martial arts is everybody's tough to some degree. Then there's some really, then there's some really, really tough guys who don't have that big of names. And then there's some really, really big names who aren't that tough. So there's this kind of paradigm shift between the two polar opposites of, you know, like a guy like Conor McGregor, his, I would say his name is bigger than his fight skills, but his Mm -hmm. fight skills are way up there, but his name is way bigger just because he's such a big superstar. Right. But then he got a guy like myself who my fight skills much much supersede my 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 name status in the game because i've been outside the ufc for so long and that's not me comparing my skill against connor i think we match up well together whatever but connor or uh you know poirier and ferguson were both offered me offered to fight me october 24th they both turned it down for their different reasons and you know some you know some they both brought up money or they both brought up don't whether it's timeline or maybe they wanted to fight each other they talked about you know standing up for each other yeah. and then and then Poirier got the Connor fight or whatever so it was all an interesting thing but I think I'm a dark horse of the division because people don't really want to fight me because there's not not a lot of upside to fighting me you know you could fight it you could fight another guy in the top 10 who's in the UFC who is a household name like I say a Charles Ol- Charles Oliveira he's on a lo- long Damn, fight win streak yeah he's good he's got some wins he's been in the UFC would for a long time would you fight him I would fight anybody, right. but when I already have the opportunity to fight a top five guy, and I've been told I was going to get a top five guy right away, Poirier or Ferguson, like why, why would I ever think about? And, and that was the problem too. Right, the Khabib's training partner, freaking everybody wanted me to fight him because his because his opponent Rafael dos Anjos got COVID and 
fell off the card. So everybody was like, oh, yeah, you should fight him. I'm like, why am I going to fight number 12 right. when I already basically have a name on a contract that's in the top five? I'm going to get a top five guy right away. I'm sorry if that makes people feel a certain way. I'm sorry if the fans think that I'm entitled or I'm sorry if the fans think that I you know, don't deserve it. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. It's the UFC's decision. Let me step into the cage. Let me freaking Figure get it out my then. butt whipped. Or let me prove to you guys that I deserve to be in the top five. Either way, we'll know pretty soon. Man, a lot of it, you just got to wait to get in there every time, huh? Yeah. man. And that, well, that's the problem. That's the problem with mixed, mixed martial arts, man, is wrestling was great because if I lost, it was 48 hours, 72 hours, four, three, four days until I got to get back into the win column and get a win if I wanted, you know, if I, if I had the opportunity. Mixed martial arts, man, if I lose... It takes me four, five, six months to get a win. And that's why that time between fights, and that's why I, I went into a, a hole, man. I lost I lost three fights in a row, 688 days without a win back when I first I lost my first fight ever to Eddie Alvarez. Very close, razor, razor thin split decision. Lost my next two fights because I just wasn't prepared mentally to lose, A. And then when I did lose, it took me so long to get in to get to my next competition that I self sabotaged or or didn't build myself up enough and told myself the lies that I wasn't as good as I thought I was mm. and the, my doubters were correct and all that kind of stuff. Um, Damn, it's not what like, a journey to come back from because especially when that's your first fight, the first fight that first fight that I lost and then it was just like man, I can't can't I'm, I'm not who I thought I was. They they were right. The naysayers were right. The media who didn't believe in me was right. You know. And then I just lost three. And that, you know, someday when I write a book, it'll be called 688 Days. Talking Damn. about, you know. And Eddie Alvarez is a gangster. He is is there man. a guy? God, he's such a. <laughs> dude, when you're watching, he, remind, he reminds me of like the greatest guy to like, I don't know what he reminds me of. Is there a guy out there when you're fighting them, when they, is, who's the craziest look in the eye person you've ever seen? And it doesn't has nothing to do with their fighting skills or anything. But who have you ever gotten in the ring with? And you're like, Jesus Christ, this guy is missing a little bit of something. Uh, for me, uh, I think there's there's this guy named Dave Rickles mm -hmm. who uh, I fought twice. Who's uh, he he had a he has a really pretty good career. He actually went over to bare knuckle bare knuckle fighting. So that'll show you. Wow. He's you know you got to have kind of have a screw loose to go to that place and yeah. fight freaking bare knuckle right <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah um but man he was just he had this look in his eyes he was a little nuts he was a little crazy he was he's the kind of guy who would carry like he was caveman was his his uh his name so he'd wear a barney rubble flintstones thing to the yeah. cage he'd carry a big old club like barney flintstone one time they they wheeled him out in a coffin he opened himself up yeah. pulled himself out of the coffin and got out there like he was a true showman but he was also kind of a little bit nuts you know um he was he was probably one of the craziest guys i ever fought do you, is there more are you noticing over the time more of that wrestling kind of flair get into uh fighting as well or has it gotten yeah. less as your career has gotten into bigger fights and you know more higher purse fights and stuff and you you know just more professional is there more of that at a lower level or do you think there's just more of that coming into the sport everywhere i think i think there was a i think there was the conor mcgregor conor mcgregor era um that said, okay, I need a trash talk. I need Gucci sunglasses. I need Gucci flip flops. I need a, a real or fake good looking watch. I don't care if it's <laughs> fake. I just want people to think I got money. I got to talk. I got to wear wear certain things. I think Connor came in and it worked for Connor. Connor McGregor is an anomaly. He is great on the mic. He is well read. He's well well rehearsed. You're crazy if you don't think that a lot of the stuff Connor has said on the on this microphone wasn't rehearsed yeah. in the back, in you know in 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 his room before he's going to bed at night. He's just rehearsing different things. And so I think when I first got into the sport, there was almost none of it. And then Connor came in. I think a lot of people started, you know, trying to look high class, nice cars, and this that and the other thing. Which that's also just Instagram models. There's so many of them out there. So we're also in the age of Insta Instagram. But I also think the tide is now shifting towards the respectful, honorable warriors. I mean, look at our division. I mean, like Poirier is one of the most respectable guys ever. Connor punched a guy, punched an old man in a, in an Irish whiskey bar. And then like his next fight was like, he apologized and he, he had his hair slicked back, beat up Cowboy yeah. Cerrone, but it was a nice, he, he's trying to play the respectable card, realizing like, man, I don't want to keep carrying around this heaviness. It's, it's a lot of heaviness to have a lot of animosity in your life. You know, man, like 
you you can have certain spats with people. Like if you're not on good terms with people, man, like you don't need sucks, enemies in life. Yeah. It sucks. Just so, so for anybody who's listening right now, if you got toxic people in your life, now imagine taking that and having a toxic relationship between you and the guy that you're fighting. How how would you perform when you have that? Some people do well with it. Some people do really bad with it. I personally do really bad with it. Bellator tried to build up this big animosity thing between me and Pitbull, and I'm not saying I lost because of it, but I didn't feel myself going into that fight. Mm, that's you know? interesting. So to answer your question, I think the sport is moving towards the more respectable. And I'll tell you right now, had a conversation with Dana White on Fight Island. He told me, hey, kid, do keep doing exactly what you're doing. We're getting a ton of great feedback from the UFC staff, from the UFC fans, from all the social media pages, from all the content, all the stuff. Like people, are, you are resonating with the fan base, with the audience. And I'm the kind of guy where I'm just going to be respectful. I'm, I'm going to, hey, I have honor in the sport, integrity in my life, high character, high reputation. And it's always worked out well for me pretty, you know, could I have sold some more tickets and made some more money by, you know, cussing, spitting, fighting a little bit more? Maybe. But I wouldn't have felt better. wouldn't have and felt maybe good not. doing it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Maybe not. Let's get this question right here, man. And then we might be about to finish up. What do we have here, Raleigh? What's up, Theo? What's up, Michael? This is Quincy coming at you from the great state of Texas. Um, my question for Michael Chandler being uh, just lay out for me what your dream career in the UFC is. Um, when a lot of guys get here, they think, you know, hey, I want the money fights. You know, I want to do the Connor gig or, you know, I just want to chase glory. I just want a legacy. I want a name. You know, I want to with that championship. So just lay out. What's your ideal career with the UFC, and where do you see it going? Gang, gang. Gang, bro. Gang, gang. Yeah, because that belt's question. back in play now, man. It is. That's a good question, man, because it's, it's good because it's it's like what's the, what's the philosophy of, of why I made the decision? You know, just, just to give a little context, I left I left the relative, uh, the relative surety of easier fights and good money in Bellator, good contract in Bellator, comfortability of being the big fish, little pond, and being kind of the poster boy for an organization to essentially come over to the UFC, ask to get thrown to the sharks, thrown to the wolves right away, and see what happens. Um, so to answer that question, I think a guy like Gaethje or Tony Ferguson fighting and showing the fans who I am, win, win that fight, fight the way exactly the way that I fight, Prove to the fans, okay, this guy's here to stay. This guy's a legit contender for the lightweight belt. And then fight for the belt, whether it's Habib or whether it's Conor Poirier, whether it's whether I'm the number one contender after beating one of those guys and then Conor Poirier is the number one contender, we fight for the title sometime middle of 2021. And then, uh, and then after that, just defend the belt and get the big fights. Because I think... And a crown. They should put a crown on you crown guys at some point. Crown would be sweet, man. Crown would be cool. You know, or like a medal. You know, like a, like an Olympic gold medal. You know? Yeah, like crown would be Crown would be cool. But keep you know? going. Sorry. Oh, no. But then, you know, get a crown, hopefully. Okay. And then... Uh, and then <laughs> okay, so defend the belt uh, a few times. Defend the belt a few times. And then for me... I don't say get the big fights just for the money, but you get the big fights because that's how you get the attention. You know, it's like the, it's like the Gary V uh, approach of capturing as much attention as possible. If you don't have people's attention or you can't get people's attention, they can't, they won't pay attention to you and they won't, you know, life is all about who knows you, who trusts you, and then who's going to, to buy what you're selling, not just money wise, not just buying products, but, but buy what you're selling. Like what kind of motivation are you selling people? What kind of character are you selling people what kind of what kind of theos are you are you selling to the people so that you can reach the masses and for me it's all about touching as many people as i possibly can through this platform that i've been given touching every walk of life every corner of the globe hopefully and uh so winning the world title and then getting big fights either defending the belt or you know bmf belt or the big you know the big fights with the big name guys to get as much attention and eyeballs on me not for the you know, not for the ego of it, but for the platform of it. Yeah, that platform. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, once people know you, then you can do stuff with it. Yeah, I mean that's and that's really what it is because it's it's a catch twenty two, and it's like oh, he just did that for attention, and it's like yeah, as long as you don't ever sacrifice your morals or your character, it's okay to do things for attention. You know, like I came over to the UFC essentially for attention. You know, I came over to the UFC for competition, competition and attention. Those are two things that I get from the UFC that I'm that I couldn't. Not that I wasn't getting at Bellator, but I get more in the UFC. So it's okay to want more attention, 
especially if you've done things to earn it, you know? Was there a time previous that you were going to come to the UFC and it didn't work out? Or was there, how long is this, I mean, how long is this whole combo going on? Is it one of those ongoing conversations for like a decade? What is it like? So it's one of those, it's one of those deals where I never actually became a free agent. There was some reports out there that Chandler's a free agent. He's, you know, he's going to, you know, but I ever, I actually, you know, two years ago and four years ago was on the last fight on my contract, ended up re-signing with Bellator with the one fight left on my contract. So I was never a free agent until August of, of uh, 2020. And uh, it just seemed like the right time this time. Back then, because it's also it also depended on what the UFC lightweight division looked like too. You know, two years ago, the landscape looked a lot different. You had Habib as the champion. You had Conor off doing $100 million fights with Floyd Mayweather. He could come back, leapfrog me whenever. You had Poirier coming in. You One, or, one of those guys had an interim title two years ago. It was either Tony or... It wasn't Poirier because I think Poirier was after that. But I maybe think, it was Tony. I think Tony had an interim title. Habib had the title. Habib wasn't coming back necessarily, so it was just a weird time. Soap opera. It was a weird time for me to come in. Now it exactly what we thought. Now it's perfect. Two years later, I'm coming in at this time, which couldn't have been even more. So two years ago, and I said this to Dana when I spoke to him. I said, "Listen, two years ago, four years ago, I wouldn't have been the guy that you needed to be to come in and be the champion and be the superstar of this, this division." And I truly believe that I'm going to be that. And I don't say that in a Damn. in a cocky. I don't say that in a cocky way. I just believe, like I want. You got to believe it. I just believe that that's that's what's going to happen. And and. Maybe there's going to be some people that laugh at me and I fall flat on my face and that's fine, but at least I find out, you know, that's how I feel in my heart right now. And you can't, you can't knock a man for how he feels in his heart. You know, a man who hitches his dream to a star, that's the only way you can go out and create, create impact in your life and do amazing things. So that's what I'm doing. And man, it's been, uh, it's been cool, but I, I never became a free agent until just this year. And it just never seemed like the right time to become a free agent until this year. Damn. So it worked out perfect. Well, I'm inspired. How do you feel, Riley? Come on, Riley. I like that, man. Yeah, you were great. Thanks, man. Did it make you feel better about the girl? Yeah. Hey, yeah. there is so many fish in the sea, man. True. true, true. Yeah, I didn't meet, get... my, meet my wife till I was like 27 years old. Yeah? Where'd yeah. you meet her at? Dude, that's a funny story. Crazy story. Actually, this tooth right here. Mm -hmm. Chipped it, like broke it in half in, in college. My buddy Justin Cole jumped off the side of the pool jumped on me and I bit it down broke it but I told them that I did it in wrestling so they sent me to this Mizzou what a casual move they, that I know, is right? huh? they, sent on, it, they sent it to my yeah come on dude, yeah, dude. they sent it to the to, sent me to the Mizzou dentist the guy who did all the dentist stuff his name was Kent Willett I knew who he was because he was a bible study leader of my bible study leader he had a great great uh reputation in town and I was looking at these pictures of him and I'm like man who's this who's this cute little brunette girl and all these family pictures of him it must be his daughter and he's awesome I like him and I don't even know him if she's half as good as she must be by being his daughter, he must, you know, she must be awesome. He fixes my tooth. I don't say anything, but I start looking her up on Facebook and just freaking fall in love with her. Yeah, I've been that, there before. Yeah, right. And then a couple couple weeks later, I join a Bible study and they start talking about this Bree Willett girl. And that was her name, Bree Willett. And I'm like, man, that's that's that freaking girl, man. Like, I love that girl. And and now I hear them talking. And I'm just like, kind of listening. I'm like, oh, so she goes to school here. Like, what? How, is she cool? Yeah. Or what's it? What path you know? does she take to walk? Yeah, every exactly. Day? Yeah. yeah. No. Well, she wasn't in the town. She was she was out of town. You know, uh. so she was a couple hours away in Indiana. But through, luckily through Facebook, I think I firm requested her. She said yes because I had I had some friends that she respected, and we're like, well, if he's friends with these guys, he must be all right. Ends up being five years later. Till I finally freaking send her a Facebook message. I'm like, hey, how are things? Like acted kind of acted like I knew her. Mm -hmm. And she, <laughs> you know, she uh she, you know, responded. We talked for a couple months. She said, Hey, I'm I'm doing residencies or I'm applying for residencies. I'm getting off here. Here's my email. So we emailed back and forth for almost two years. She would she would wait like four, five, six months to respond to me. Wow. I would email her and she wait freaking three months to respond to me. And I'd Savage, email her right away. Bro. She'd wait two months to respond to me. Like, just we're left closer. me, just dangled me 60 for, days, for yeah. two years, you know? And then finally I wore her down enough. She got coffee with me and then we fell in love right there, January 24th, 2013 and called yeah, his coffee baby. in Columbia, Missouri. And you met her the other night. She yeah. Her, beautiful so. lady, man. We had a nice time. I came over for the, um, just to watch some of the election and yep. it was a nice time, man. Yeah. It was fun, man. And then, uh, took some the to go plate. I wish I'd have taken hey, a bigger one. Yeah, dude, you should have, man. We still got like six pounds of brisket. That's what I was thinking. I was like, and, and somebody's yeah, like, you're going to take it to go plate. I'm like, yes, I, they only got three people living here. Yeah. <laughs> you can't yeah. eat all of this. Two Mike's adults and a four year old. Exactly. Yeah. I was going out of town. Yeah, dude, I'm glad you took some. That I was still fun. got some if you want some. 
That was fun, man. Yeah, um, yeah that's like my that my, my yeah my whole thing is like I'll yeah I'll send girls like DMs. I'll be like, hey, did I see you at the grocery? And, the, <laughs> and then they're like, I live in Moscow, and I'm like, oh. well, yeah, I was there. <laughs> yeah, my bad, my bad. But I'll send those. I must have been on my friend's Facetime. He was walking through the grocery. I saw you in the background. <laughs> His name is yeah. Vladimir. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fucking great, Vladimir. Um, that's all I got, Riley. Any question you want me to ask for you? Um, all right, Riley. Michael Chandler, man, dude, it's 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 a pleasure to watch your ride, man, and thank you so much for coming and joining us today, man. Got it, man. Thanks for having me. It's fun. Yeah. Now I'm just floating on the breeze, and I feel I'm falling like these leaves. I must be cornerstone. Oh, but when I reach that ground, I'll share this peace of mind I found. I can feel it in my bones, but it's gonna take a little time for me to set that parking brake and let myself all my shine.